further ado, we'll move on to um, Brad's presentation, who uh, is it's uh, titled Trying to Meta Compile. Uh, Brad, you're on. All right. <clears throat> So um, I, I have a confession to make. I, uh, you know, have implemented a number of different uh, fourths, but I have actually never successfully implemented a meta compiled fourth. Um, I struggle with uh, being able to wrap my head around uh, the meta compilation concept, uh, and uh, this talk is uh, not a, uh, a completed uh, thing as I often present, but uh, rather is a work in progress that I'm, I'm talking about some of my struggles uh, thinking through trying to build a meta compiler. Uh, and so uh, I encourage you to see it in that light. Uh, I definitely am not an expert in meta compilation uh, because I have, have not succeeded in doing it well. So um, let's see. So uh, meta compilation is, is the idea of building a fourth from within another fourth. You, you generate an image of the new fourth and as much as possible you're trying to write the new fourth in fourth. Um, and in other contexts uh, this is sometimes called cross compilation. Uh, and uh, there is sort of a, a, an interesting question of whether a, a cross compiler or so rather a meta compiler in the fourth sense is a cross compiler. Outside the fourth community, uh, the term meta compiler sometimes is used to refer to things like lexers or parser generators. Um, and, and if anything, fourths usage of the term meta compiler is considered a little bit peculiar. Um, but I think I think there is something to it as a distinct term because uh, fourth meta compilers aren't quite cross compilers either. They uh, often can't target other architectures easily. They're they're sort of uh, uh, they, they have subtle dependencies on the existing uh, system, and they frequently have sort of leaky assumptions about things like dictionary format. They may assume that the, that the target has a, a similar dictionary format to the host. Um, and there's this, this uh, distinction of, of how hermetic or how, you know, sort of uh, dependent uh, the, the target is on properties of the host is actually, I think, one of the key issues where I get stuck. Um, dictionaries uh, are tricky with, with meta compilers because you have to deal with words that are uh, both on the host and on the target. And uh, it's not as simple as just being able to sort of focus on just the target because you have uh, typically a need for some immediate words that will, uh, or, or what would be an immediate word from the point of view of the target, uh, to run on the host. And so there's a, a pretty high potential for collisions uh, and you have to think very carefully about the order in which things are defined and uh, sort of be able to visualize the whole, whole dependency tree. Vocabularies can help with this, um, but they add a lot of complexity. I think this is a, an instance of where uh, I feel like vocabularies in fourth are, are still sort of not quite right. There's something where we have a namespacing problem and vocabularies offer offer a lot of power to be able to sort of specify arbitrary flexibility but they don't make it very easy to reason about uh, dependencies between layers in something like a meta compiler and i've found at least uh in in the meta compilers that i, I would say that I, I come closer to sort of fully understanding i wouldn't say that there's any that i i i, I, I could uh, state that I, I can visualize the whole thing in my head. But for example, uh, Ch uh, Chuck's, um, some of Chuck's uh, fourths that use a, a dual vocabulary for uh, normal words and then a separate macro dictionary uh, for, for immediate words, uh, they, they seem to be a little bit easier to reason about in relation to meta compilers. Something similar happens uh, in, in uh, Frank Sargent's Pygmy Fork, which is both the first first fourth that I encountered, it is it does have a meta compiler. It's a very seemingly simple meta compiler looking at it, and yet I struggle even with that one to, to sort of say that I can sort of fully visualize uh, the flow of what depends on what. Um, there's repetition sort of implicit in meta compilers. Immediate words um, are needed oftentimes on the host, but eventually sometimes on the target. Um, and so you oftentimes will need to uh, interpret uh, the same piece of code twice. And I think this is another area where 
um, the, the sort of lack of not so much standardization in the sense of standardized words, but standardized practices about how you think about reuse of source code and forth makes this tricky. Do you um, have your meta compiler sort of have the knowledge that, well, I have to reload this portion of the system uh, twice uh, using blocks or, uh, or, or with source code? And then at the end, uh, a lot of meta compilers are sort of uh, building on top of the existing system having subtle dependencies, and then they, they sort of clobber that system in the process. And so at the end, if you want to be able to get the system back to uh, sort of a, a clean state, you end up having to do things like uh, sort of forget the, the entirety of everything you've built up while you were uh, meta compiling, or, or in some cases, it, it's almost like you've just trashed the system and you're, you're better off uh, quitting out of the system after, after having uh, sort of built a, a, new, a new target. So, what have I been struggling with? Well, I, I got the idea, and I, this has been one that I've been puttering around in the background with, with without huge success, uh, on building an X64 uh, subroutine threaded target. And, and in particular, what I would like to do is to uh, target uh, uh, building a, an ELF executable or, or a Linux executable. Um, and I'm, I had originally the intention to use blocks, but eventually sort of slipped into using uh, source files, and, and that's probably where it will stay. Um, and, and so far, just because I al already struggle, I think, with the meta compilation concept, I, I've been trying to avoid uh, making uh, reliance on vocabularies, because that also creates the problem that if you want your meta compiler to be able to sort of uh, run within the context of, its, of itself, now you, you have to bring along all of the vocabulary plumbing. So my plan, and I've sort of partially executed on this plan, but, but not fully, is to def define a start marker, compile a, a bunch of the words that, are, uh, that I need from the host that are either immediate or, or sort of assembling words, and then define an alternate definition of find to, to search words in the target. And then define alternate colon and, and uh, uh, right bracket to be able to uh, compile things into the target. And then go ahead and compile the, the immediate and assembling words and then the normal words. And, and then I should have a fourth. And then I write things out and, and, then, and then maybe forget everything back to the marker so that, so that everything's in a clean state. So that's, that's the, the high level idea. Um, with x86, uh, because this is subroutine threaded, I'm, I'm going to need to write some x86 code. I'm too lazy to write a whole x86 assembler. Uh, a lot of the ones out there are, are for x32 uh, x for, for, uh, bit. Uh, probably could go shopping for someone else's, but you know, what I've decided to do is focus on just the, the portion of x86 that I need. Um, and then I've slid into uh, doing what I think of as a premature optimization of moving around the stack pointer uh, lazily. And so rather than every single uh, uh, maneuver that manu manipulates the data stack pointer, I, I, I try to uh, only do it at certain critical moments. So the register assignment that I picked uh, is one uh, influenced by the, the nature of x86. So x86 has some quirks, and one of them is that um, the base pointer, uh, RBP, uh, because it's meant to be used as a base pointer for C, where you, you typically, inside of a, uh, each call frame for a function, uh, need to access your local variables, it has the property that it, by default it assumes uh, an immediate offset will be used in, in situations where that requires some, typically one additional byte uh, for a lot of the other registers. So it's a nice register to use if you want to be able to access not only sort of the thing at that address, but, the fit, but a number of addresses around it. Uh, and this works particularly nicely with my, my sort of lazily updated stack pointer. And then uh, the return stack pointer for subroutine threaded obviously needs to be the, the system stack. And then I, I often waver with, with x86 as to whether what the best register is for top of stack. Uh, but I've, and you'll notice all of these mirror the choices in, in SwiftX. I've, I've gone with RBX. Um, there's some instructions that encode more densely with it. Um, Chuck oftentimes uses RAX. I think it depends on whether you use some of the, uh, some of the old older peculiar instructions in x86 or sort of the more typical newer format ones. I, I know a bunch of compiler folks and, and, and have the general sense that a lot of those older encodings 
uh, tend to be uh, hit the slow path on, on various x86 variants. And so I'm wary of them. And so for that reason, I've sort of been sucked into doing RBX. And then all the other registers I, I've sort of left uh, left to go wild. That, that happened, that there's a happy accident where uh, when you make raw Linux system calls, uh, the, there's no collisions with, with those registers. So that's kind of nice. And, and so you can do things like call the, the exit system call or the, uh, the write system call uh, using some of these other registers. And then, um, so how does the encoding work? So x86 is big and complicated and uh, quite literally as the, as the first line there, it has a lot of legacy prefixes, but it just has a lot of legacy in general. And so um, there, all of these are optional except the opcode. Um, but uh, in particular, I want to draw your attention to the, to the rex uh, prefix, which is a register extension prefix. And for 64-bit in particular, uh, this is necessary because uh, there's additional, um, additional registers that, that have been added. It's gone from 8 to 16, uh, and you need this extension in order to specify which of those you want to refer to. Moreover, uh, it is also the place where uh, some additional options for 64-bit go. There's some other uh, other uh, bytes that show up optionally in, in x86 instructions, depending on the addressing mode. You may need additional registers to refer to. Uh, there are indexing modes where you can uh, have a, a base and, and, and a scaling factor and, and so on, uh, and then and then immediates. Um, so the rex prefix uh, lets you specify uh, the, the missing uh, fourth bit from each of the different uh, places that within the, the rest of the encoding that you might uh, want to refer to a register. But then it also has this width flag. And by default, if you don't have this width flag set, you'll get a 32-bit data operation, although typically it's 64-bit addresses. And so you, you will typically need to set this, uh, you have this rex prefix on almost every instruction. So I've got a, a word uh, rex.w that, that uh, assumes that you want a wide uh, operation encoding 48 there. Um, and then, for example, here, here is a, uh, an assembling word that uh, increments the stack pointer uh, by, by one cell by eight. Um, and then uh, another word that compiles uh, an increment by an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary size uh, with the stack pointer. And so you can go through and, and add uh, a bunch of operations to do encodings. Um, here's that, that premature optimization I mentioned of, of lazily moving the stack pointer. So what I do is as uh, things are being uh, assembled, I keep track of an offset. And the offset is the, uh, the current offset from where uh, RBP is to where it should be. Um, and I've got some words to define uh, increments to uh, move RBP uh, either by a positive amount adding to it or a negative amount subtracting from it. And then, uh, and then some words to reference the op make access in the offset and uh, one, one cell prior to the offset, convenient. Um, and then I've got this word balance, which goes and in, if you get to a point where it's important that now the, the data stack pointer reflect uh, the actual position that it should be at, it will look at the current offset and, and sort of in one, one single step update it. Um, and then I've got some words for, for uh, incrementing and decrementing the stack pointer, uh, but doing it lazily. So it will check to see, uh, it will increment it by one cell or decrement it by one cell and check if you've gotten so far out of range uh, that you can no longer uh, use these uh, uh, built-in immediates that are they're in all of the, uh, the opcodes that reference RVP. And so here's some convenience words, uh, just uh, blanking out the top of the stack, so it's equivalent to doing a drop followed by a zero, um, doing a comparison, uh, and then uh, moving, uh, moving a value uh, from, the, um, from the, the prior, uh, from one below the top of the stack to, to the top of the stack. Um, and then, then I start in earnest defining some of the opcodes. I define NIP uh, just by adjusting the stack pointer. I do dupe with a tick because I ended up using dupe a lot of places later, and this is where the meta compiler starts to, to show up. Um, and then things like uh, one plus and one minus are just manipulating the top of stack. Um, drop and dupe and over, this is the first example where you see this, notice it says move O plus uh, zero. This is a, uh, I'm referencing that offset so that as I encode 
uh, words that reference the data stack, I take into account the fact that I need to add an offset uh, to whatever uh, is currently in RBP. Uh, and then similar thing with over. Um, here's some uh, 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 here's some of the return stack manipulation, and I'm able to reuse um, uh, some of the words that were defined previously. Um, and then here here's uh, core arithmetic, so plus minus and times. And again, here I'm referencing the uh, the offsetted uh, RBP. So it makes it a little more complicated than if I was just encoding one type of assembly for this uh, each of these instructions, but it's not, it's not too bad. And, and it may, means that you have one less in, instruction per operation. And then the same story with and or and XOR and then invert and negate are um, uh, just manipulate the top of the stack. Um, comparisons, this is where I use that comp zero, uh, and then I'm able to, to uh, use set L and set E, which are some uh, instructions on later versions of x86 that set a flag uh, based on uh, the result of the comparison. Uh, I have to balance out the stack uh, when I do an exit. I don't have to for an op. Um, for uh, loading and storing, that can just, again, continue to uh, tolerate the offsets. Uh, and same thing with the uh, uh, single byte loading and storing. Um, this is a place of regret and confusion for me. So there's a lot of different ways to encode a literal on x86. And so I've got different ones depending on if it's a 32-bit unsigned or a 32-bit signed or a 64-bit. Um, and you can be more memory efficient. So I have this very complicated word for defining, uh, handling the different cases of I want to compile a literal and sort of being as minimalistic as possible in terms of how many bytes it takes to encode. And then finally, I get into uh, some of the immediate words that will be needed on the system. So begin, again, ahead, and so on. And for each of these, I need to balance the stack before I do anything else. Otherwise, uh, things will get tripped up. And a little bit of care has to happen in terms of uh, where that balancing happens for words that involve uh, conditionals. Um, and then here's a big, big fat word that does uh, a syscall. And so it, I balance the stack here. Probably I could probably avoid balancing it, strictly speaking, but, but I, I happen to because I, I think I had written it before I had uh, added the balancing code. And so it actually has to know about quite a few different registers and even use some prefixes that aren't the, the Rex W uh, prefix. And then it does loads up all the registers and does, does one of the syscalls. So it takes a, you know, Six, six parameters, so not a very forthy word, but syscalls have a lot of options. And then we get to ELF, and ELF is actually uh, not, not a terrible format in terms of dumping some out. It's not as easy as like a DOS com file where you just dump the, the data, but uh, there's a header that's just a fixed header and specifies the ABI and, and what type of machine it is and so on. Um, and then there's a, uh, a, a a second header that specifies how many uh, uh, the machine type, how many sections are in uh, in the system, uh, and basically a series of uh, what are called program headers that are basically areas from the file that need to be loaded uh, into memory, and they're typically loaded by memory mapping them in. And in this case, I'm able to just get away with a on this uh, line here that says uh, ephnum a single entry, and so. Uh, and then one other important thing here is there's a, a an offset to the entry point in the in the program. So you have to choose where in the memory space you uh, you want to lay things out, <clears throat> or sorry, where you want to start execution. And one nice thing with ELF um, that's that's flexible in a way that say Windows executables are not is it has this nice practice of letting you in the executable choose the the uh, address space layout. So I can sort of decide definitively. Uh, how I want to lay out that 64-bit address space and where I want to map things. There are some constraints on, uh, on portions you can't use, but it's actually relatively flexible and the system will sort of move around it. But the easiest and simplest thing for a fourth that I can do is just have a single section where I load, uh, at, in my case, I just picked virtual address uh, 400,000, uh, and I just load uh, everything in the, in the entire file. So I map actually the entire ELF file including all the headers and, and, and everything in them. And then I just map that as, as read, write, and execute. So I have sort of full freedom to, 
to to uh, uh, run and execute code, which I, I think will make life easier with a, a subroutine threaded for. Um, and then for now, I, I don't. This is this is as far as I've gotten. Um, I've got a, a definition of uh, uh, doing the initialization to set up the stack, and then I go ahead and uh, call a syscall to uh, emit. Uh, or sorry, to call write, uh, just referencing the the front of the executable. And then uh, similarly to do uh, an exit syscall and then just exit out uh, returning the value 42. Um, and so, so that's it. I'm, I, I, um, I'll, I'll show a demo very quickly. Um, I need a better name. I was going to call it Wisp, and then I noticed that Wisp is just sort of, sort of Wisp is also sort of people want to use that for their Lisps, and uh, it, it, uh, it's an, it, it certainly implies small, but it's it's used for a bunch of existing things. So I need something else if someone has an idea for a better name for an itty bitty subroutine threaded for it. Um, I'll, I'll take questions, but I'll also sort of uh, simultaneously throw up the demo here, which might take me a second. So I'm gonna. Swing over to that. So feel free to, to um, blast out your questions while I pull up. I have a question, question, Brad. Yes. Um, so in the meta compiler space, you have colon definitions that are creating, um, you know, um, storing in memory. So C fetch, it seems to me that you had to redefine C, I'm sorry, um, C comma. Mm -hmm. You had to redefine C comma to point to memory above your, your dictionary space because you want to have this linear uh, binary that mm -hmm. gets loaded and executed, right? Yes, that's right. So you, you redefine C comma. Um, so so this is so I should be I have not yet and this is another instance of one of these subtle things where yeah exactly if you're defining a bunch of words in the middle of your meta compiler if your target relies on that so I, I am missing that piece of the meta compiler absolutely in fact that that's a uh, and it's 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 all these little things that pile up where there's this uh, you know you need to be so suddenly aware you know normally when you're defining things in fourth you don't need to be concerned with how they're laid out in memory, but exactly, if you're in, if you define a, a host word and that's in the middle of your image, now you've got a problem. So you need some other area in memory to park the, the target and so on. Um, so this is, this is just my, uh, all the things that I showed in the slides just now. Um, I can run a, a thing to do, uh, you know, a dump of the assembly that I'm getting out so I can verify that I'm getting Sort of the instructions I expect, and in this case, it's just some setup code uh, and uh, one syscall passing in a bunch of immediates. And notice how um, I'm pushing a bunch of things on on the stack with, where they do waste some operations, moving into EBX, and then from there into offsets from RBP. But notice that the RBP is not getting adjusted until right here, where it, it finally gets adjusted in one jump. So that's that saving one uh, one instruction per per uh, basically uh, pro approximately per opcode by deferring uh, updating the the, uh, the RBP and then I do the syscall and then a similar thing for the second syscall um, and it doesn't do a lot now it quite literally just prints out that elf at the beginning of the uh, the file so it's just printing uh, the uh, the first three the first three bytes or actually it's not the first three it's the uh, I skip over the first byte because that's a sum and f. So just three three bytes out of the file because that was an easy place to get a string. So not not a lot as yet, and and, and in some sense missing the core of the meta compiler, missing that parking of the target. So, um. Thanks for the uh, the overview here, Brad. Appreciate that. Uh, had had you seen in the C world this thing called actually portable executable? It's uh, by a person named uh, Justine Tunney. I have I um, have seen it yes um, I I it, it sort of works around the uh, the, the the different uh, uh, executable formats and sort of tries to find a least common denominator that that uh, is runnable uh, by various means on the, uh, on a variety of different targets I for, I've forgotten how many it's quite a few yeah and, and it's a bit you know a bit C uh, uh, specific rather than four but I I know that uh, she's entirely open to, I mean, Python and 
uh, TCL and a lot of other uh, Perl. There's been a lot of uh, variants that they've tried to t attach to. I, and I mean, I know that this is a little bit uh, larger than probably what a lot of people do here, but it would be interesting if, if I could uh, try to morph a G-Force on top of uh, this 8 format too, so we could have one binary that runs everywhere. But I don't know what the overhead of carrying all the uh, cross-platform crap is for, for that, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think GeForce that we, you'd run into. It, I think it tends to assume a lot about needing uh, needing a libc and sort of that that type of thing. But, but yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the definitely uh, the the uh, lunch of uh, uh, Justin Justin Tinney's uh, uh, work is, is sort of yeah interesting in terms of thinking about similar minim minimalist types of things to the to the fourth community. So great, thanks. Hmm. Any other questions? You ever feel like you'd want to write your own opcodes? Um, write my own opcodes in the sense in the in the CPU creation sense. Um, sometimes, although I I I think it's uh uh it's a it, it's also sort of one one more one more open constraint in a, in a space where sometimes i think art art comes from uh constraints so i, I don't know i uh there yeah i i have a lot of a lot of directions you could go in terms of computer architecture so so Sometimes, but yeah, not you. Usually, usually enough enough struggle even dealing with the one architecture in front of you. So, <laughs> well, one of the things I think is going to be interesting when you finish this um, is all all these modern CPUs have these very primitive instruction sets. You know, and for like for you to to create a word, sometimes it's three instructions. I mean, if you're lucky, it's one instruction. Usually, it's two or three, and uh, where you could, you know, just write the thing in System Verilog, call it a day. But we'll get you there. <laughs> hey, Brad. Um, I I've often thought that um, somehow to keep things straight in our minds that. Uh, like if I were trying to do what you're trying to do, the the meta compiler, that I would do it in a different language, like um, like a scheme or or a Lisp or something like that, because to me that that helps that helps the context to be kept straight in my mind. You know, so have you ever thought about that? Well, so 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 most of the most of the fourths that I've done are are sort of closer to that and, and and oftentimes it's either sort of an assembly you know you're starting an assembly and and then sort of building up the pieces or you're i, I will sort of use macros and c and uh going up one level of abstraction would, would would almost certainly help i think part of what's appealing though about the meta compiler concept in, in the first place is this idea of bootstrapping forth from within forth but <laughs> unlike you know a lot of the um typically if you write a cross compiler in another language um, that cross compiler is it, uh, you're you're defining the pieces of the target uh, as a data structure and you're thinking about it as a data structure. Whereas I think what's appealing, at least in theory, in practice I've struggled with it, but in theory with the medical compiler concept is that you're sort of just defining more code uh, and not thinking about the target as a as a piece of data. But uh, but yeah, so <laughs> yeah. But, I don't know if that answers your question, but it does. Um, so along those lines, though, I could think maybe I don't know. Um, uh, the thing that pops up in my mind is okay. Maybe we could leverage Charles Moore's um, Chuck Moore's uh, colorforth idea, and if you're if you're in one context. The fourth code is one color, and if you're in the other context, it's another color or another style, you know, or a combination even. 
So, 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 so I, boots, I, I bootstrapped a few Colorforth. One thing that's neat, that I find sort of simpler to understand with Colorforth, Colorforth I think actually I still believe is actually the simplest sort of core to a, to a fourth. But what's neat there is that you sort of start, all you really need to sort of bootstrap a new, new world sort of in Colorforth is a second lookup table for the colors. And then you basically, well, you just need, you know, one definition for the, the, uh, the implementation of each of, each of, the, each of the colors that you, you start from. And then you put that in a new table and you can readily bootstrap. And so in some ways I find Colorforth sort of the simplest to reason about, but it also has the property of, I think some of my, my other fourths like micro e fourth and, and ESP32 fourth where, the, where they're, um, you're, you're defining, um, you're defining a core that has enough of fourth that you can then start implementing the rest of the fourth at higher level words. And rather than sort of building up an image uh, that's ready to go in a target, which is sort of subtly different. So I think there's a, there's an ordering, there's a, you know, I, I, it, when I reasoned about like micro e4, for example, I, I identified about, about, about five words that I consider sort of the, the nucleus of, of what you need to be able to have enough of a fourth to sort of have the wheel spinning and then you, you build the rest of it on top. Whereas with a meta compiler, those are like the very last words that show up. And so you build everything else up to those five. And I, what it, maybe what I need to do is draw out the big dependency tree and get it straight in my head and it would, it would make more sense. But I, I can see it starting with, with, when you already have that sort of wheel of, you know, the sort of parse, parse uh, interpret one word, dispatching it through find and, and so on. When, it, when that happens at the very end, I think is where I struggle. Uh, because then you sort of instead need to lay out the dictionary uh, and, and sort of have all, all of the bits sort of ready for the dependencies of those words. Whereas a lot of my C-based forths, like you'll define those words in C and so it's sort of a cheat. You're not sort of thinking through uh, how you would have those words, define them before you've got the pieces you need to define. Anyways, so I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If, I, uh, if thanks, I were trying thanks. to do it in Windows, um, I would want to make it like a completely separate process and keep like one on the left side of the screen and one on the right side of the screen and just have the separation so complete that, you know, anyway, that's my last thought. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Um, in the interest of time, I think it's best to move on. Uh, to uh, Philip's presentation. Uh, Philip, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, you're on. 